Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will talk about autism awareness with our guests. Colleen Allen, President and CEO of Autism Alliance of Michigan. Brian Hall, Executive Director of Autism Delaware. And Joanne Quinn, Executive Director of the Autism Project in Rhode Island. So, so thank you all. April, April, World Autism Month. So we're celebrating by sharing and informing, generating awareness through this show. So one of the things that, that, that I'm so fascinated by is that in 2020, the CDC reported that just under 2% of children in the United States live with autism in some form. But the term itself is complicated, it has a complicated history. So let's go around the table and, and let's just hear your take of what autism is and, and talk a little bit about the populations you serve. So Colleen, you wanna give it the first shot at, at, out of Michigan? Sure, sure, thank you. And thanks for inviting me today. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's a good first question. Um, I always say autism looks like a lot of other disorders and a lot of other disorders look like autism. Um, it really requires the eye of a highly qualified trained professional to weed out what is a typical speech delay, a cognitive delay, uh, what's a teenager with depression um, who's socially isolating and not autism. Um, so, you know, the numbers have grown. We know that the CDC comes out every two years with, you know, what seems like striking growing numbers of people with autism. Um, and, and some of that is, you know, we're getting better at diagnosing. We have improved our tools. Um, we're identifying early. That's automatically going to open up more people into the spectrum. And the definition over many years has really gone from what we used to think of as a very classical autism and, and the most severely affected with all of the behaviors across three different categories um, to those with, you know, that, that really struggle socially, um, which is, you know, the core feature is, is the social challenges. Um, but our highly, you know, high ability working in jobs. And um, so it's, it's a varied, varied presentation. And that makes knowing this population a challenge in some respects. And there are certain skills that are that are well developed and overdeveloped in people who are uh, autistic, but also certain disabilities. So this is not just a one a one shot picture, right? right. It, it right. is a a very complex uh, web, and it's really important to um, not paint somebody with a a condition as if they suddenly then become generic, because the condition is just an attribute that uh, takes a very individual uh, manifestation for each person. And I see, Brian, uh, you're nodding. Uh, one of the things that, that I'm also interested in is that uh, so many more boys are diagnosed, uh, diagnosed with autism than girls. Um, do you feel that that, uh, that fact is uh, about a, a, a gender relationship or is it a underdiagnosis of girls um, in, in your populations? Well, I think it's a... Uh difficult to say. I think, um, and as uh, Colleen was explaining, it's very complicated, um, the whole process of, of deciding whether someone has autism or not. And early, early uh, displays of certain behaviors give you some indicators on how a person may be. Generally speaking, over the last 30 years since, you know, I've been doing this work, it presents as boys. Boys seem to be a key um, carrier or displayer of autism uh, characteristics. Uh, and I, you know, I don't necessarily think it's an underrepresentation. Uh, I just simply think that, you know, they are, um, uh, because they're so, uh, they present in a way that uh, uh, it's very custom, very um, early, you can see real early in the way they interact with others, it just stands out. Yeah, I wonder whether the manif it's a different in manifestation that we perceive um, easier, um, but uh, you know it, it's not an answerable question, right? I mean, it's it's possible that autism manifests, you know, in in ways that we don't necessarily perceive in girls as as um, as um, 
as being obvious. Um, exactly. You're right, Mark. I think, and that's where I was trying to go with that. Sometimes you could walk down the street, the same street 400 times, and you might pass 400 different individuals with autism. And 400 might be male, 400 may be female. You just, you never know until a significant incident occurs or some something out of ordinary happens, which allows you to see something that may make you think someone might be presenting with uh, autism-like uh, characteristics. So you just never know. And jo Joanne, how do you see autism from your corner? And then we're going to talk a little bit about the programs that you have to support families, because when we're talking about autism, we're not talking in general just about an individual. We talk about an individual, but we're also talking about siblings, we're talking about families, we're talking about parents, we're talking about communities, right? We're talking about uh, supportive communities. But um, before we get into that, uh, Joanne, how do you see autism from your perspective in terms of its definition, its manifestations, and, and how we in a society ought to see people living with autism? Yeah, our big thought process is that you need to look holistically, you need to look at the whole person and look at the characteristics and the differences, not necessarily uh, weaker or stronger, but differences. The brains are, all of our brains are wired differently. This is a neurologically based disability. And so they see, think, and do things differently. And as I say that, I think it's Stephen Shore, and I think he was the one who originated, if you've seen one person with autism, you've seen one person with autism. So what we do here, our number one intervention is to get out there and teach people what autism is, what it isn't, how it might present in different people. And more importantly, here are strategies that we can use to help our friends, colleagues, and family members be the best that they can be. If, you know, because um, I think as Stephen Char, again, I uh, said, you know, the developmental differences versus developmental delays, because with delays, I know my son's brain he is so far better in certain things than I am, so that's not a delay, but there are some areas that he has challenges in, so it's differences. Um, so we, we really, our mantra is you need to understand autism, and that's the core of the training that we do for everybody, from nurses in the hospital to parents and caregivers. This is what autism is, and this is how you can assess and look at the person you're working with to see how their autism impacts them because you go from the very verbal to the nonverbal to the sensory mess to I can do withstand anything to the difference between the female and male presentation, but you really need to look at your person and see what, what is the challenge that is getting in the way of you having a successful time right now. And then you go back to your bag of tricks or supports and strategies, I don't mean to minimize it, and say, okay, I need to communicate it better to you in a concrete way so you understand what to do here. You know, it strikes me that what you're saying is no different than um, than how I, as a parent, treat my own children or treat the children of of uh, my uh, in laws. Um, yeah. You know, it's it, it's really it's really just um, you know we're placing it in a little bit of a different category because uh, there might be additional uh, things to consider. But really, what you're talking about, Joanne, is uh, it is a very human to human, you know, seeing the individual, trying to, you know, meet them where they are, listening, you, right? Yeah, and, as, you know, as a parent advocate, I have a 25-year-old son with autism and how I got involved with autism. Um, we really need to meet them where they're at, and we, we learned we need to meet the families where they're at also, you know, and that, as a very new you know, advocate, it's like, you got a piece of paper, you got a pen, write it down, that's what you got to do, you know, versus stepping back, seeing what the family needs, seeing what the individual needs. How can I help you today to make you more comfortable and more successful? Is that our approach? I, totally. And Joanne and I have worked together over the years. And one of the things we've learned is our community supports our community. We reach out to each other and work with our, each other and learn different strategies. Similar to her program, you know, in Autism, Autism Delaware, our, we have no buildings. Our, all of our services are community-based. So we have to work one-on-one -on -one with families and individuals within their environments, creating natural supports and really allow them to be productive members of their community and pay taxes like everybody else. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's really done on an individual basis. And that begins, that work begins when they're in school. That work continues through the state systems of care. Um, and it just continue working together and creating this kind of open opportunity to learn from each other. So. 
Can we talk a little bit about uh, some of the myths surrounding autism and the, and the origins of autism and the causes of art, autism? And in particular, since I started off uh, as, as people were joining this, I talked about um, the, the, um, the vaccinations and, and COVID and so on. There's this whole um, meme going around about vaccinations causing autism. Colleen, could you just comment a little bit on, on uh, this this stuff because it seems to me that we we give too much credence to disinformation um and and it really interrupts the flow of of conversations on solutions so uh can we just get this out of the way um so i we're very much an evidence-based organization we you know we my staff are all master level professionals in various fields um, we were created to provide families with the most up-to-date, scientifically-based information. And so I, I qualify my response with first noting that um, we, we rely on the CDC. And what the CDC has produced year after year after year since Andrew Wakefield was essentially pushed out of Europe, um, that vaccines do not cause autism. We, we just stand by that. And I know there's a number of organizations that don't. Now I will say this, um, to earlier points that autism is a very unique disability. It is a neurobiological disability. I would claim that in as much as the presentations are diverse, so is the biology. So it does not mean that there are, aren't subgroups of children that would be susceptible to some type of vaccine reaction in the same way that we could be susceptible to a reaction to any vaccine. Um, it doesn't mean that groups of children should not be vaccinated. Our group studies have shown that there is not a connection. I think it's really dangerous to um, perpetuate other arguments. Um, what we need to do is encourage families to have hard discussions with their physicians around those concerns, to explore vulnerabilities, things like family history of autism, family history of immune disorder, I mean, there are certain conditions that make a person susceptible to reaction for just about any vaccine. Um, I'm really worried about um, that argument and our population declining vaccines for COVID. Because if you look at fatality rates for COVID in the population of people with autism and disabilities, it's about three times higher than the general population. Mm -hmm. Your risk of dying from COVID is much greater than your risk of a vaccine reaction to the COVID inoculation. So that that's that's just where I stand with that. Well, I, I'm, so glad, I, I'm so glad you gave uh, such a nuanced, uh, nuanced response. Um, my, my biggest concern and I'd like uh, Joanne and, and Brian to weigh. My biggest concern has to do with disconnecting uh, evidence and drawing con drawing conclusions before you actually look at the evidence. Yeah. Um, and I I personally agree that for uh, these kinds of interactions, you could have a multitude of different consequences. You have to look at the evidence to see which consequences are actually true consequences. So if you saw a correlation in a particular pop, uh, population or subgroup, then you have a cause to be concerned, but you, you cannot um, start off with, with a theory, not have it backed up by the data, yet perpetuate that in a way that could be damaging. Joanne, uh, could you just uh, comment from your perspective uh, on this? I agree with, uh, with, with just about everything Colleen said. I think everything Colleen said. and. Uh... Quite honestly, I've been surprised that uh, there hasn't been more in the news about autism parents refusing it because I know my son is older now, but um, all of our staff here were part of a hospital system and everybody didn't even blink an eye and off we went to get our immunization as well as their children. And we worked uh, really hard with our Medicaid office because they were doing specific clinics for um, 16 and up, I think it was uh, 16 to 22. 
and then the adult system was doing it to get the inoculations to individuals, especially in congregate living and uh, with development of disabilities, because there is a higher rate of uh, dying amongst our population. Um, what I find amazing is when is the amount of nurses and first responders and some others who who are saying no. Um, so we our people here, we're in terms of um, the vaccines over the years, we always said you need to have that personal conversation with your pediatrician because that's yeah. where you're gonna get your information. We too are evidence-based and it's not up for us to tell you what what to do. So it's about choice. Right. And you're not and you're not forcing anything, right? You're you're looking at evidence, right, Brian? You're you're not telling people they must. You're you're saying look at the evidence, right? Absolutely. We're providing yeah. the information that we have available to us and sharing the information with our families. Medbar, our state's uh, developmental disability services, providing information. We're trying to be as clear about it, about this is the reality. This is the situation. These are the numbers. This how it's impacting a particular community versus an, uh, another community and allowing them to make the decisions. But our job is to provide the relevant information that's available. That's what Mark, can I just make one more comment? Um, the other, the other challenge I think all three of us can can probably attest to is that, you know, there's for lack of a better term, I mean, there there really is a tribe mentality um, that that our families and in lots of populations you see this, where all the science in the world it it doesn't matter if your neighbor who has a child with autism had an effect that you see every day and you've engaged in personally, it, 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 it still holds more weight than mm -hmm. any research you want to bring forward. And that's, that's the community. And it, you find this where there is no cause and no cure around a disability that, that, that people latch on to what's personally affecting them. And, um, and so our job is just to educate to the extent we can. Mm -hmm. It's it's such a good point where there is no cause, no cure. Um, you, you, you just are constantly searching. And that's <clears throat> natural because there is a cause. We know mm -hmm. it is. We know there is. We just don't know what it is. So searching and searching and searching is a very human response. Right. Um, the question really becomes, do you search based on, on gossip or data? That's right. right. And and we are a gossipy um, uh, uh, animal, right? Mm -hmm. We're a social animal. So what you're saying is, you know, there is a piece of this that is about person to person interactions, and and you're part of that by forming your community. So let's talk about the kind of services that you each provide. Um, Joanne, let's give you the first bite of the apple. Could you just describe the network of services that you provide? Uh, b both to um, the, the people who are living with autism, but also with the family and to the community to in, in promote understanding of, of uh, people with autism. Sure. Um, our mission statement or our elevator speech is that we are the hub of hope, where we connect people with the resources that they need to either support someone living with autism or an autistic individual so that they can lead the most independent and purposeful life as a, as a child and eventually as a, as a young adult. And we do that by educating everybody and anybody who comes into contact with an individual with autism that our primary, primary mission. We came out of the public schools and you know we educate people on how to engage, best engage with someone on the spectrum, whether you're an in our nurse or you're a teacher or you're a parent, we're not going to tell you how to do your job, but we're going to tell you this is how you're going to get someone with the characteristics of autism or autism to better engage in whatever it is that the two of you need to get done at that moment. Here are some strategies. We're not, you're not going to be, you know, educating them or changing them during the three hours in the ER, but you're going to know the first thing you do is ask mom, you know, how do they get best get their information? And how much information can you get to someone so there are no surprises? You know, and you set it up, and is it going to be miraculous? <clears throat> One in a million it is, but the majority of the time, um, it goes a whole lot better than it would have if you're just talking at somebody and, you know, throwing the needle at them and doing different things. So um, we have been getting so much really good uh, engagement with the um, first responders and others because they see our people all the time, especially now as, what is it, 10,000 people a year are aging out into the adult system 
across the United States. So um, we want them to be able to take that time to be able to identify the individual and have some strategies. So that is, you know, we joke, you make eye contact with us, you're stuck, you're gonna have to listen to us. This is what we have to say. But we do it uh, with our, you know, professionals uh, educating the, the, the schools across the country now. We're doing some training in South Africa next week. And uh, we also do direct social skills groups and uh, advocacy work. At, but one of the biggest things is a lot of the work we do with our, our colleagues down in Delaware is the parent consultant, the peer-to-peer -peer mentoring of parents who uh, have lived experience, but also are trained and understand our system of care here in Rhode Island, as well as the national level uh, in schools and how to work it. Or you just need to call somebody and saying you're having a bad day and you're you know, your PTA moms don't understand it, but your autism moms do. And our peer navigators are really, they are critical to uh, getting the information across. And, and it, the hospitals and other areas, uh, family service organizations are realizing that the community health worker and peer to peer really are important. And uh, they need to be reimbursed. There's my plug for that. Colleen and Brian, you know, it's got to be better reimbursement for what we do because we save doctors and their offices and schools and everybody else a ton of time taking the parents by the hand and, and showing them some lived experience of how to get through a lot of the navigation of the system of care. So important. You're, you're creating community, you're exchanging information, you're providing some practical help, including on, on the reimbursement side. Uh, we just completed a poll, Brian, 83%. Um, now, this is a select audience, of course, uh, interested in the topic, but 83% of the respondents have encountered autism in their lives. And then we, the second poll was even more interesting. We talked about um, what do you feel is the most challenging aspect for those living with autism? And we received the highest uh, response for the, the fact that American institutions are not designed to accommodate those who live with various disabilities. We're just not prepared. Mm -hmm. We just don't know. Um, and then the other two um, responses that got a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, positive hits were uh, ignorance and behaviors of those who don't live with autism. And then the whole idea of providing skills. But what was, what was interesting here is that the, the top responses were not about the people living with autism, but about the institutions that surround them. Yep. and the people who surround them. So, uh, Brian, um, in terms of your uh, support, um, you provide a lot of direct support to families living with autism. Is part of this empowering uh, advocates uh, for uh, to change those institutions and change people around them and bring more understanding uh, into communities so that we are, as a society are shifting in a way that, that benefits the community? So yes, um, as um, Joanne was describing, you know, we started in the kitchen of a few folks' homes. You know, we were meeting there and, and uh, families came together and said, we need to do more. We need to figure out how to provide the kind of supports and resources that our families will need as our kids continue to grow and the system, education system could not provide. And so over the course of time, that has continued to become our mantra. We work with one family at a time, one community at a time, one system at a time. We work, so like, you know, rather than sitting down and always arguing with a system that hasn't supported us in the most effective way, we go to the table, present an argument about the pros and cons of how to do this better and to create the opportunity for a mutually exchange uh, conversation that leads to change. Um, to fight, we know that the institutions uh, have, are not necessarily built to support our communities. We know that. So the question should be is what can we do? Where can we find common ground to allow us to grow and to begin to change systems to allow more opportunities for growth? And I think in Delaware, we've been improving each year. We have some work to do. You know, right now we're, rates are always an issue. So we're fighting with, you know, working on a McNesby Act where our legislators said they're gonna support our DSPs at a higher level because ultimately we need DSPs to support our communities. And DSPs? Direct support professionals. Yeah. Yes, direct support. For, because what I always say, what works for our autism community works for other communities. And yeah. a lot of times we get stuck in this kind of, it's autism. I said, no, this is about the community. 
if we can figure out a way to begin to work together to solve these issues, it will help others. And that's what it's about, creating communities. Then you have one community helping another. The peer-to-peer -peer model that Joanne talked about, it's one family helping one family. And then that family will help another. So you begin to create a common language and common terminology, which allows people to come together in a different kind of way and see through some of the complicated diversity issues that exist within our communities because we can agree on a common cause that we want more for our families and our children. Um, and that's what we do in Delaware. And that's what we, we try to promote in our interactions. And we're always willing to sit down with a group and, and someone who may have closed the door on us. You know, one of the things that I think that makes us who we are is we have community partners across the state mm -hmm. and businesses that have allowed us to come in and work with them. They're not getting caught data to work with us. But what we do is we talk about what it is and the purpose is creating communities, creating diverse communities and creating these natural opportunities where we, you know, we can exchange information and they get a sense of empowerment by having a better understanding of our community, which allows others to get jobs and, and, and others to maintain jobs. So, I mean, it's interesting. I would say one of the challenges, one of the most traumatic challenges has been through this past year has been, we rely on partners in the community. So when our partners close, it hit us hard. We don't have buildings. We work with Lowe's, we work with Wawa's, we work with all these different groups that still stayed up. We work with hospitals. So our staff were still working with our individuals on the spectrum who were working in these diverse uh, communities because they needed to work. They needed to support others in the community. So we try to figure out ways to, to show the impact that our community is having on the greater impact on the greater community through these kinds of interactions. Um, because people get caught in, you were talking about myths that, that our folks can't do this. That's so incorrect. I know I've met with uh, Colleen before and I know all the great things she does a little bit on a larger scale, uh, scale than what we do, but it's the same idea. You know, you're working with one person, it creates change. And that's what, we've, that's what we're all working towards, creating not this awareness at this point, but acceptance. Yep. You know, that's what we're working on. And I think, you know, our communities, whether you're in Michigan, Rhode Island, or Delaware, that's what we're trying to create, is this acceptance, because we are working. We are success, having successes. And, and you know, sometimes, you know, person that's having success may be on a spectrum, but you'll never know. Uh, you know, you just don't know. And I, and I think just having those doors being open to us is a key to creating sustainability and success. Brian, you're so right. I mean, this whole idea of in the industrial revolution, we become part of a workflow, a machine, we're cogs, and we become a little bit alienated from each other. I think we are beginning to discover that civil society requires cultivation, it requires communication, it requires sharing, it requires us to actually spend our time not investing in ourselves, but investing in others, right? Investing in our neighbors. Um, we just completed a poll uh, in which we said, where do you get your information on what autism is? And 47% said uh, from nonprofits that support people with autism, 47%, it was the, it was the largest cohort of answers. And then uh, friends and family, as you said, right, sharing um, articles and, um, and other online uh, resources. And then media is also part of this picture. So this whole idea of, of civil society being engaged in its own healing and dealing with its own problems in a way that, that um, helps to uh, strengthen your neighbor. I think your point is, is tremendously important uh, we're coming to the end of our time. It, it seems to have gone in a flash. Uh, so Colleen uh, and then uh, Joanne, I'll give you the last words um, after after Brian's articulate uh, uh, advocacy. Of, yeah, uh, no, just uh, I thank you, Brian. What a way to end the show. And, um, you know, just to reiterate that, um, you know, it is about access, inclusion. It's about a broadened definition of diversity to talk about ability. Um, and then I just, you know, even recently with the vaccinations around COVID, um, you know, at least in Michigan, we've done a lot of work around how to accommodate people with disabilities. And I feel like even with the attention to autism lately, we still have to have a voice that says, 
but what about invisible disabilities? Like mm. we've talked all about physical accommodations and we have got to get better at neurodiversity, recognizing that just because behaviors are different doesn't mean that um, they can't be included and welcomed into our communities. So I would end on that. And Joanne, how would you, how would you like? I agree, Colleen, and I think, you know, one of the other things we say is that all behavior is a form of communication and it's up to us to listen and really do our best to understand what an individual is trying to, the point they're trying to get across and what do we need to teach them in order that they can get across, the message across better or how do we help them communicate it uh, versus, you know, being punitive to them on their disability. We need to find their strengths, see what we need to teach them uh, check with them if they want to be taught. If they're a self-advocate and very verbal, they have their opinions. And we can teach them the strategies and let them choose when it's appropriate or not appropriate um, to, to do what they, they've learned in terms of strategies. So I think if we really look at the whole person and really look at what lagging skills can we support them with so they can have their dreams, like our other kids have their dreams and their families can have their dreams, um, I think that's it's really important. And I, I think we're set for that because I believe it was the graduating class of 2013 that has always had kids with varying disabilities and challenges in their classroom since kindergarten on. That's when the big inclusion uh, really took, took hold. And you're seeing that now where the next generation, it's like, oh, well, that's just Patrick. You know, if you want to talk about Patrick, talk about Blue's Clues or what you need to do because that's what Patrick likes to do. And it's, it's just roll off the cuff and respect for their classmates. And so I'm very hopeful with the next generation that uh, they'll pick up the fight and, and keep going for meaningful inclusion where we work with each other, that we all get what we need to be supported from each other. Brian, I, I'm, I'm gonna actually let you have the last word. If I'm going to change one thing in myself, what would you have me change? I would have you just change the idea that that diversity doesn't exist. Because I think diversity happens every day. The way we look at, I look at something as blue, you see it as red, diversity does exist. And understanding that diversity does exist allows us to bring together a more complex picture of our world. And I saw, that would be my, my thought. Did you put me on the spot, Mark? <laughs> uh, so it's, it's, it's a redefinition. It's a redefinition and an embrace is what you're saying mm -hmm. of diversity to include autism yes. and other aspects, really embrace the whole human family mm -hmm. and, and see those individuals who are different from ourselves as our brothers and sisters. Well, I think the, as, to say the least, I think as I look at us here today, I may have autism, you never know. Right. So, so I think having the ability to, to, to look beyond diversity in the sense that, you know, just because someone acts a certain way does not mean that they're not bringing something special to the table. Right. And so to see a difference as an opportunity, as an opportunity to learn, as an opportunity to grow, as an opportunity to say, hey, what can we do that might make this individual's life a little bit better? You know, so that's how I kind of view it, that, you know, when I think about diversity. When I, when I look back at my own family, extended through history, there are so many things we don't know because we didn't have the labels. And maybe that was okay, right? Labels can divide, labels can help, labels can also divide. So maybe that's one of the things that we should think about is thinking back of, uh, and with a little bit more uh, patience and tolerance and seeing if we can help and, and in, uh, through our engagement uh, rather than create barriers. Joanne Quinn of, of uh, the uh, Autism Project in Rhode Island, uh, Brian of Delaware, and Colleen Allen, the President CEO of Autism Alliance of Michigan. Uh, you've been so helpful. Thank you so much for sharing. That's the nonprofit report all.
Everyone mask up, stay safe, and uh, we'll see you on Thursday when we'll be talking about people with uh, hearing impediments. It'll be a very interesting show, uh, including uh, with some translators. Uh, thanks so much for your questions, and we'll see you next week.